narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. We're on chapter four. <laughs> Trying to hide the chicky back there with the blue lips. All right. Mr. Hopkins remained but a short time in the office of overseer. Why his career was so short, I do not know, but suppose he lacked the necessary severity to suit Colonel Lloyd. Mr. Hopkins was succeeded by Mr. Austin Gore, a man possessing in an eminent degree all those traits of character indispensable to what is called a first-rate overseer. Mm. <laughs> Upon one of the out farms, oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Mr. Gore had served Colonel Lloyd in the capacity of overseer upon one of the out farms and had shown himself worthy of the high standard or the high station of over overseer upon the home or great house farm. Mr. Gore was proud, ambitious, and persevering. He was artful, crude, and obdurate. He was just the man for such a place and it was just the place for such a man. It afforded scope for the full exercise of all his powers, and he seemed to be perfectly at home in it. He was one of those who could torture the slightest look, word, or gesture on the part of the slave into impudence and would treat it accordingly. There must be no answering back to him. No explanation was allowed a slave showing himself to have wrongly accused, to have been wrongly accused. Mr. Gore act full, acted fully up to maxim, laid down by slaveholders. It is better that a dozen slaves suffer under the lash than that the overseer should be convicted in the presence of slaves <laughs> of having been a fault at fault. No matter how innocent a slave might be, it availed him nothing when accused by Mr. Gore of any misdemeanor. To be accused was to be convicted, and to be convicted was to be punished. The one always followed the other with immutable certainty. To escape punishment was to escape accusation, and few slaves had the fortune to do either under the overship of Mr. Gore. He was just proud enough to demand the most debasing homage of the slave and quite servilely, no, I'm sorry, quite servile enough to crouch himself at the feet of the master. He was ambitious enough to be contented with nothing short of the highest rank of over overseers and persevering, persevering enough to reach the height of his ambition. He was cruel enough to inflict the severest punishment, artful enough to descend to the lowest trickery, and obdurate enough to be insensible to the voice of a reproving conscience. Obdurate. O obdurate. Sorry. O B D U R A T E. Okay. His. Pre <laughs> I forgot that I was being videotaped. <laughs> okay. Ignore the. Okay. His presence was painful, his eyes flashed confusion, and seldom was his sharp, shrill voice heard without producing horror and trembling, trembling in their ranks. <laughs> Mr. Gore was a grave man, and though a young man, he indulged in no jokes, said no funny words, seldom smiled. His words were in perfect keeping with his looks, and his looks were in perfect keeping with his words. Overseers will sometimes indulge in a witty word, even with the slaves. Not so with Mr. Gore. He spoke but to command, and commanded but to be obeyed. He dealt sparingly with his words and bountifully with his whip, never using the former where the latter would also would answer as well. When he whipped, he seemed to do so from a sense of duty and feared no consequences. He did nothing reluctantly, no matter how disagreeable. Always at his post, never incons inconsistent. He never promised but to fulfill. He was, in a word, a man of the most inflexible firmness and stone-like coolness. His savage barbarity, barbarity, 
barbarity, that is, was equaled only by the consummate coolness with which he committed the grossest and most savage deeds upon the slaves under his charge. Mr. Gore once undertook to whip one of the colonel's, one of Colonel Lloyd's slaves by the name of Dempsey, Dempy, D-E-M-P-Y, I'm sorry, D-E-M-B-Y, D-E-M-B-Y, Demby. He was, he had given Demby a, uh, but few stripes when to get, excuse me, to get rid of the scourging, he, excuse me, good gracious, <laughs> to get rid of the scourging, he ran and plunged himself into a creek and stood there at the depth of his shoulders, refusing to come, to come out. Scourging is, um, if you've ever heard of that with, the, with regard to what Jesus experienced in the Bible, it's where the whip is, um, the whip goes around the body and then it's pulled back so that uh, the, actually it's being whipped. I just can't help but think of the Cat of Nine Tails which has a, the whip with nine, uh, nine um, strings, leather strings, and in those leather st thick strings were uh, bones and jagged metal and whatever was available at the time that Jesus was um, in the earth. It was bone, really, and um, brittle bones that were parts of animal bones that were pierced through so they hung out on both sides of the leather band and when the whip uh, hit the body it literally stuck it stuck because the bones pierced the body like tacks like um, nails and then the whip is pulled back and that would cause these rips and tears across the torso of Christ if you see Passion of the Christ you see a really good depiction of it if you've seen that but when I see scourging as is in the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass that's what it reminds me of um, I don't think these whips had bones and things in the end of them and I know they weren't a cat of nine tails it was probably one long piece of leather that was whipped and then pulled back so just the pulling of the metal on the of the leather on the skin did damage enough okay let me get back. Forgive me for digressing. <laughs> Mr. Gore told him that he would give him three calls and that if he did not come out at the third call, he would shoot him. The first call was given. Demby made no response, but stood his ground. The second and third calls were given with the same result. Mr. Gore then, without consultation or deliberation with anyone, not even giving Demby an additional call, raised his musket to his face, taking deadly aim at his standing victim, and in an instant poor Demby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. Ah! Uh, I imagine Demby must have been looking at um, Mr. Gore at the time. Uh, just, um... I'm sure he was probably facing him in the water. So he pretty much was shot right through the, right through the front of his head. Mm. A thrill of horror flashed through every soul upon the plantation, except, excepting Mr. Gore. He alone seemed cool and collected. He was asked by Colonel Lloyd and my old master why he resorted to this extraordinary expedient. His reply was, as well as I can remember, that Demby, oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> his, re his reply was, and then in parentheses, Frederick Douglass is saying, as far as well as I can remember, that is, that Demby had become unmanageable. He was setting a dangerous example to the other slaves, one which, if suffered to pass without some demonstration on his part, on his part, would finally lead to the total subversion of all rule and order upon the plantation. He argued that if one slave refused to be corrected and escaped with his life, the other slaves would soon copy the example, the result of which would be the freedom of the slaves and the enslavement of the whites. <laughs> Boy, that sounds like Egypt. <laughs> What, Avery? <laughs> Look at the river. Here's what we're eating. Can you see that? Let me see if I can get it to show. Come on, show up. 
Anyway, let me tell you what it is. Oops, that's not even the side. It's Luigi's Blue Raspberry. Not at all healthy for you at all, but it's very healthy. this is what we're eating. It's fake blueberry. And, uh, it is not fake blueberry. It is fake blueberry. You're so fake anyway, blueberry. her lips are blue. I put on lipstick to cover my eye. <laughs> my tongue is more blue. Okay, great. We got to keep going. Forgive me for digressing. Digressing. Okay. Mr. Gore's defense was satisfactory. He was, he was continued in his station as overseer upon the home plantation. His fame as an overseer went abroad. His horrid crime was not even submitted to judicial investigation. Of course not. <laughs> it was committed in the presence of slaves, and they, of course, could neither institute a suit nor testify against him. And thus the guilty perpetrator of one of the bloodiest and most foul murders gone unwhipped of justice and uncensored by the community in, li in which he lives. Mr. Gore lived in St. Michael's Tabot County, Maryland. When I lived there, and he, when I lived there, I meaning Frederick Douglass. And if he if he is still alive, he, he very probably lives there now. And if so, he is now, as he was then the highest esteemed and as much respected as though his guilty soul had not been stained with his brother's blood. I speak ad advisedly, advisedly when I say this, that killing a slave or any other colored person in Talbot, in Talbot County, Maryland, is not treated as a crime either by the courts or the community. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thomas Landman of St. Michael's killed two slaves, one of whom he killed with a hatchet by knocking his brains out. He used to boast of the commission of the awful and bloody deed. I had heard him do so laughingly, saying among other things, that he was the only benefactor of his country in, in, in the company, and that when others would do as much as he'd done, we should be relieved of the of the dreaded, the D, what did I say? What did D, E, D, blank, 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 D meant, Avery? Das, the dreaded niggers. What? Quote, the dreaded niggers. What does D mean? What does, I'm sorry, D space D. It came up earlier in the book. Do dead. you remember what it meant? Dead. Oh, dead niggers. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Oh boy, my mind doesn't think on these words. I think on whatsoever is true, noble, holy, lovely, of a good report. And if there be any virtue, if there be anything worthy of praise, these are the things my mind stays on. I think on, I meditate on. So I am, I, I don't remember such demonic, dastardly <laughs> um, adjectives. Oh boy, the wife of Mr. Giles Hick, living but a short distance from where I used to live, murdered his wife's cousin, a young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mangling her person in the most horrible manner, breaking her nose and breastbone with a stick so that the poor girl expired in a few hours afterward. Oh, boy, so she died a horrible death. She was immediately buried and had not been in her untimely grave but a few hours before she was taken up and examined by the coroner who decided that she had come to her death by severe beating. The offense for which this girl was thus murdered was this. She had been set that night to mind Miss, Mrs. Hicks' baby, and during the night she fell asleep and the baby cried. She, having lost her rest for several nights previous, did not hear the crying. They were both in the room with Miss Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, finding the girl slow to move, jumped from her bed, seized an oak stick of wood by the fireplace, and with it broke the girl's nose and breastbone, and thus ended her life. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now this is a true story, ladies and, lady, ladies and gentlemen. This is a true story. We're not talk about, talking about something fabricated. This is true. This is what people did for real. Oh. I will not say that this most hard murder produced no sensation in the community. It did produce sensation, but not enough to bring the murderess to punishment. There was a warrant issued for her arrest, but it was never served. Thus, she escaped not only punishment, but even the pain of being arraigned before a court for her horrid crime. Whilst I am, whilst I am detailing bloody deeds which took place during my stay on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, 
I will briefly narrate another, which occurred about the same time as the murder of Demby by Mr. Gore. Colonel Lloyd's slaves were in the habit of spending a part of their nights and Sundays in fishing for oysters, and in this way made up the deficiency of their scanty allowance. An old man belonging to Colonel Lloyd, while thus engaged, happened to get beyond the limits of Colonel Lloyd's, um, of Colonel Lloyd's and on the premises of Mr. Beale Bondley. At this trespass, Mr. Bondley took offense and with his musket came down to the shore and blew its deadly contents into the poor old man. Mr. Bondley came over to see Colonel Lloyd the next day, whether to pay for his property or to justify himself in what he had done, I do not know. At any rate, this whole fiendish transaction was soon hushed up. There was very little said about it at all and nothing done. It was a common saying, even among little white boys, that it was worth a half cent to kill a nigga and half a cent to bury one. Oh, humans. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it just, Avery, you are not allowed to be in the next video because you are laughing and you are black. You <laughs> okay, because I'm, I am older than you. I'm not telling y'all my age. Actually, I am. I'm 56. 57. <laughs> 57. But um, I've lived a long life as a, as a Christian woman who loves Jesus more than I love anything, anyone. My heart hurts when I see how evil humans without Christ can be. Without Christ, man is evil evil in every single way you don't have to believe it you don't have to agree with me <sighs> that's what i believe and my goodness and i don't mean it in a i mean don't get me wrong there are a lot of people i'm not talking about the child that has never had an opportunity to come to christ i'm not talking about the adult that has never had uh who has never been asked the question uh, I'm not talking about a generally good person <coughs> who doesn't know Jesus. The result is the same without Jesus. I believe that all man, whether good or evil, is bound to hell, bound for hell. Because Jesus is the key that makes the difference. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm talking about man who literally rejects Christ intentionally and serves idols or himself. Uh, the Bible says without Christ we're nothing but and look at the evil this is a true story he is speaking of what he saw with his own two eyes and I just see evil and it's not evil it's not the white man or the black man um, that I that is the culprit here here we are. Let me be honest. Everyone who does evil is being used by the devil. They just don't know that he has a plan for them. The devil doesn't care who he uses. You're not getting in good with Satan by being used by him. You do things that are evil. You think you're getting in good with Satan. <laughs> he's out to get you too, and he will destroy you as soon as he's finished using you. So you are no better than the ones that he uses you to try to destroy. That's just the truth, because Satan does not he doesn't fight fair, but he's also a defeated foe. So it's not flesh and blood that we wrestle with. It is powers and principalities and wickedness in high places. It is Satan's ploys. And the only way we win against the devil is if we resist the devil, one, submit therefore unto God, two, and then three happens. The devil is the he that flees from you. So resist him. Say no to Satan. Say yes to Jesus. And the result is the devil flees from you. There's no other way. Okay. All right. That is the end of chapter four. Thank you for watching.